style. Well, uh, not merely did uh, Paine invent the idea of democracy in the sense of saying that everybody throughout the world had the right to be uh, play a part in the control of their own governments, but he also invented the kind of language in which people would discuss these things. He did it in a language which everybody could understand, and that no doubt is why it was so much feared. He was very proud, of course, of the kind of language that he had developed. He didn't pay much uh, count of where he got it from, yeah, but the only person I think he acknowledged as being the, where he learnt it was from Jonathan Swift, and undoubtedly he had ref read the uh, Drapier's Letters, uh, the famous pamphlets in which uh, Swift had attacked the English government of uh, 60, 70 years before, and he used that kind of language in a modern idiom to say things that had never been said in this kind of language before. In particular, he was replying to the famous book in which uh, Burke was attacking the revolution, but whereas Burke's book could be read, and it's still a brilliantly writ read book, but it was read by ten dozens and hundreds of people, Paine's book was uh, designed to be read by thousands and tens of thousands, and within a matter of a few uh, years of its publication, he translated that into fact, and considering that nobody had ever written political writings to, of that scale before, that alone was one of his greatest achievements. Um, are there any analogies today? He, he was very much against the aristocracy. Right? Americans have a hard time understanding British aristocracy. Relevant today, his attack on well, he was certainly against the aristocracy. He was against the monarchy too. He was he was a, a republican, and of course his first uh, republican in the American sense too, because his first uh, antagonisms were directed against George the Third because of what the English monarchy had attempted to do to the uh, people of America. But of course he was associated with that attack, in associated in that attack on. The English monarchy was what this parliament was doing because the, for a while the uh, parliament here was supporting what, uh, uh, what the king was doing against the Americans and so uh, uh, Paine would direct a lot of his attack against them and in the course of doing that he explained the, to the Americans and in the, to the rest of the world when they read his books how the English system operated and it was a terrible corrupt story because he described uh, he, he described the, how the whole thing was held together by the uh, ways in which uh, bribes of one form or another were paid in the whole system of government, he said, was a corrupt system of government and no, nothing other than a corrupt system of government could have been uh, inveigled into the task of sending great armies over to the United States or America, it wasn't the United States then, to try and stop them having their way in the way things should be run. So all that entered into it too. And, uh, but he was broadened the attack much more than that. He never limited his attack just on the English monarchy or one kind of monarchy or one kind of aristocracy. He said indeed that he was a citizen of the world and all what the ideas that he was preaching were ideas which could be valuable and must be sustained not only in our countries and civilized countries so called but across all the other countries too. He was one of the very first people who argued for the independence and freedom of the Indians. There were some others who did it too, but he was amongst those very first. And then when he got to the United States, he was one of the very first to attack the whole idea of slavery. And if he'd had his way, the slavery would have been abolished way long before it, uh, 60, 70 years before the act, the, the, the decision was made in the United States to abolish it. He was way ahead of his the time on all these questions because he translated them into simple questions. He said that every man, every woman too, but he, women's rights, he wasn't quite as far ahead as some people have thought in that, but he was very much in favor of every man and every woman having the same kind of simple democratic rights. And that's why he put it in the terms of much more the rights of man than uh, questions of democracy or organized government. He said these are the things which people uh, they, they, it ought to be just as much their right as being and having the right to eat and to drink and everything else. And so he made the whole idea simple. And uh, the more simple it was, the more revolutionary the government thought it to be. You're a modern-day contemporary politician. 
Why are you interested in pain? What well, partly yeah, because I think a lot of, uh, we've got lots of politicians, I dare say, we've got a few on that side of the Atlantic too, who like to make all these issues very complicated and like to say that it's only if we understand great, great complicated questions of business and economics and all the rest of it, it's only if you do that that you can understand what politics are about. Thomas Paine wouldn't have that. Uh, this, people were saying that, by the way, at the time. Uh, Edmund Burke, his great opponent, was also saying way back in the end of uh, that century, the 18th century, that politics was such a complicated affair that ordinary people could never understand it. Now, that was what raised Paine's fury more than any other single thing, in my opinion. And he said, no, no, politics is something that everybody can understand. They're simple questions. He learned that partly from Jonathan Swift, by the way, who said that politics is a matter that can be understood by many heads. And that meant uh, that people, if they applied their minds to it, could see what was right and wrong in the way people run their governments. Of course, that, that very notion was revolutionary at a time when uh, the whole idea of the government was assembled in the hands of uh, secret organizations like Parliament and the monarchy and the rest, and when they were reaching conclusions which were of such painful uh, consequence for the mass of the ordinary people. And so he said, let's take the politics to the mass of the people. And he's still doing that, by the way, because of course there are still people all over the world who say that uh, you know ordinary men and women can't understand these complicated questions. But that was what Paine hated more than anything else. Has he been an inspiration to you personally? Well, yes, and, he did, and indeed, uh, uh, to some of the very greatest uh, people, of course, that we owe the debt, in my opinion, for telling us about it. One is the great American monk, your Conway, who uh, wrote the life of Thomas Paine at a time of great difficulty when the most of many of these facts, some of which we've been talking about on this program were not known at all. Moncure Conway was the man, American, who came over to this country and determined to books in the libraries, all annotated, but Thomas Paine hasn't yet received anything like that acknowledgement, but I hope it's going to come. We discussed that. He's certainly not a Marxist. <laughs> No, well, Karl Marx hadn't been born in his time, and Karl Marx, so he certainly wasn't a Marxist, and uh, indeed the, the idea of socialism, or even the name of socialism, had not been invented at the time of his life. And he certainly was a believer in the supporting the small trader or the small businessman and his rights, as well as other people's rights against the uh, corrupt uh, aristocratic governments of the time. And that, to some extent, has given rise to the idea that there were, uh, that he believed in a kind of free market. But of course, he, the, the kind of, what he wanted was to lift the taxes which people imposed then, but the taxes were not imposed uh, for social benefits as they sometimes are today. The taxes were imposed on people in order to feed the corrupt aristocratic governments, whether it was the one here in America or the ones here in Britain. So. Uh, there were some, however, on the right who have uh, seen uh, Paine as uh, being on their side on that account. And there was also a famous occasion when uh, President Reagan quoted uh, from uh, Thomas Paine, when he quoted the words, we have it in our power to begin the world anew, which was a famous statement made by Thomas Paine about the glories of the future that the United States could show to the rest of the world. Uh, I'm afraid that President Reagan used those words uh, to apply to his Star Wars program and as particularly as that program has since collapsed altogether, I don't think that Thomas Paine would have been very pleased about it being used. I've sometimes thought that it was uh, all done for a wager and that some of President Reagan's scriptwriters, one said to the other, I'll bet you that you won't be able to get a Thomas Paine quotation into a Reagan peroration, but the, he succeeded in doing it. However, uh, there have been some other occasions. It's even been said to me that Mrs. Thatcher quoted Thomas Paine on some occasion. Well, if, I'm, if, she, if, if she did, I'm sure she got it from some quotation book where she hadn't read the context properly, because of course, most of what Paine was saying on all these matters were in the revolutionary conquest, uh, t uh, t the revolutionary context of his time. That didn't mean to say that he believed in permanent revolutions. It did mean to say 
that he said here, as long as uh, people are denied their elementary rights, then the first thing we've got to do is to see whether those elementary rights can be established. And that's maybe why he retains his uh, relevance today so much, because there are so many parts of the world where those elementary rights are not established. Not only, uh, well, partly of course, in countries, the backward countries, so-called in Africa and India, and of course Payne has played a very big part in those countries, by the way. Well, his books have been translated there and carried into operation there in this century, just as they were a year and a half in the United States, ago in a century and a half ago in the United States or here. So uh, th that's part of the other reason. But it was the revolutionary background of his own time which enabled him to say things that were uh, looking to the future and some of those countries have seen that future come, some of them are still expecting it and uh, he retains a kind of relevance on left and right if you like to put it more than most of the others in that field but to seven the age of democracy <laughs> no well when soon after Payne uh, died or uh, towards the end uh, one of his great opponents in the United States called called it the age of pain and he didn't mean that as a compliment because he wanted to deride what pain had achieved but of course today I think it's got a far greater significance because undoubtedly what is happening is it isn't a new age of democracy and if there's any single man who deserves to be honored as the prophet of democracy it's Thomas Paine because he was writing things 150 years ago or 200 years ago which are now become relevant much more relevant and when we see these events that are happening across the whole of our modern world whether it's in uh, Eastern Europe across the Soviet Union or in the uh, countries of Africa and Asia it is a new age of democracy and in that sense it's also an age of pain and it is amazing because in many of those places they are now reading pain much more eagerly than they've ever done before and so maybe we'll be start to read him more here in Britain or in the United States of America certainly they're reading him in France too that they've they've just had a new French translation of his rights of man they had one within a few years of it being published here in London at the time of the revolution and now they've got a, a new one that's been published in France which is being read I'm sure by many thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who've never read him before so it is a new age of pain and I think that's a healthy thing for all of us because he was one of the very truest and bravest champions of democracy that the world has ever seen. We are also living in a globalized age and this is something else that he talked about. Yeah, he called himself a citizen of the world and he didn't, he wasn't prepared to accept the restriction of his patriotism to, to any single country and he was denounced as a an enemy of his country here in Britain, he was denounced as an enemy of his country in the United States, he was denounced as an enemy in France and eventually he was almost guillotined there, but in all those places he was saying here there's a larger and greater appeal than the national one, there's an international appeal, there's a responsibility you have that all the people that you have to all the peoples of the world and he wrote in that sense I think uh, more expansively and bravely than any other single writer. You predicted the, uh, Na the League of Nations and the flag of the rainbow and boycotting. The That's right. And when uh, he said that, there, of course, there were lots of... Lot of he hated the idea of settling uh, disputes by people going to war. And he, in, in, I don't say exactly invented it, but he was one of the very first who said, well, why don't we settle a lot of these international disputes by having a system of international arbitration and so you could have some other kind of judicial way of settling these disputes which was something that was what we think is a, a 20th century idea and indeed we haven't yet carried it into effect but he was talking about this more than 200 years ago because he said here yeah, of course we want to see these same democratic ideas applied on a, a wider scale and so I don't think there's any other single figure in history who has more right to rejoice about the liberations that are going on today. Not all those liberations are taking way and taking place in the most of
peaceful method, but he would have liked it done that way because he also said if we recognize the rights of other people, if the rights of man, if we recognize them properly, then we can settle these disputes and arguments by peaceable means and not by force and brutality. Thank you. Thank you.